So a man that needs no introduction, uh, David Heinmar Hansen. And uh, David, thank you again for uh, taking time out of your day and uh, you know, answering questions for us. <laughs> Okay, so sure. Uh, Where did Anthony go? I, know yeah. he has I, I can manage this. Uh, no longer requires yeah. that I stop browsing for 40 minutes. So, uh, and you have my undivided attention. Right on. All right. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> okay. Well, I will ask a question then. Um, I guess my first question would be you know, we've read a, a lot of posts coming from both the, the Rails team and the, the MERB team. Uh, but ultimately, mm -hmm. what was the like the impetus? What was the impetus behind really bringing the two together? Um, I think actually the the run up in I don't want to call it outright animosity, but tension perhaps is the right word uh, brought this on in some way. So um, when the tension started really uh, boiling back in uh, in December, um, it actually led us to start talking more to each other in some ways. Because we felt that the tension that was was building just wasn't helpful at all. Um, and in many ways, I thought that we were building false tension. Um, we were fundamentally trying to do the same thing in the same way, which is evident from just how much of urban rails is, is incredibly uh, similar, where you have almost exactly the same APIs, you have almost exactly the same goals being uh, pursued, but that just that led to a lot of duplication of work and led to a lot of tension, and um, that just felt like it was completely unnecessary. So we started talking more um, to teams together, and, and what we realized was that a lot of this tension was basically just built on the misconception that because Rails didn't necessarily do something about some of the things that the Merv guys cared about, it meant that we would never want that stuff in Rails. Um, so, for example, um, the agnosticism that, that the Merv guys were really interested in pursuing um, was never something that was against the grain of Rails. Um, we had one thing that we, and I had one thing that I truly cared about, which was um, sensible defaults. Um, and defaults for everything, that there should be one starting answer for everything in the framework. But that's not at all at odds with allowing people to pick another answer if that's what they want. So just because Rails ships with, with prototype, there should be absolutely no reason to discriminate against people who want to use jQuery. And I think just somehow that's certainly our fault and my fault and uh, the fault of the Rails community in general, that that got mixed up. The fact that we have strong defaults got mixed up and conflated with the notion that um, prototype is the only way to do JavaScript, or active record is the only way to do ORM, or whatever have you. And that's just not true at all. So what we basically needed was just we needed some champions. Somebody who really cared even about the agnosticism because, for example, they were using something else. They were using jQuery. Uh, JavaScript. They were using data map or SQL or whatever for the ORM. We just needed somebody who were willing to put in the work. And the Merv guys had already demonstrated that they were willing to put in the work. They've done a ton of this work already in the group. Um, so what we basically realized was since there's no real tension, there's no real conflict, we want the same things on, let's say, 95% of the, of the base of what a framework should do. We want exactly the same thing. On the final, let's say, 5, 10 um, we want different things, but the different things being different compatible things. Um, so why not share that base of 90 to 95 percent, and then work together to ensure that the last five to 10 percent um, come out great as well? So that's basically the, the long way around to how that then uh, came to be, and then it all happened really fast. After we realized that, all right, if this is true, if we want the same thing for the 90 to 95% case, and we can agree on the last 5 to 10%, then, I mean, what are we wasting our time for? Let's just get this going. Let's just make this happen. And uh, and, and so we did. And um, I, this is where we are today. And I think uh, so far it's been working out really well, actually, in many ways.
better than I had even hoped that it would. Because, I mean, there's so many, there was so much tension built up that you could see, all right, we can poison the well, there's no way we can work together, or the communities won't gel, or what have you. Um, but I think that's just proven not to be true at all. Um, I've been working with uh, Yehuda and the rest of the team for, um, for about a month now. And I think that that experience so far has been great. I mean, we find ourselves in agreement way, way more often than we find ourselves in disagreement. And when we are in disagreement, we just settle in with facts. Either you bring in a benchmark or you bring in a piece of uh, code that demonstrates something being advantages or not. Um, so, so far, so very good. How you doing there, David? Anthony here. Uh, my question is, uh, is there anything coming in an upcoming version of Rails that you're really interested in to the point where you're developing a lot of new code to, co to contribute to Rails that's a brand new feature, something that you want to hint at or that's really interesting, or are you mainly working on fixes and the 3.0 integration of MERM? So, for starters, I've been mostly focused about 2.3 uh, for now. Uh, we just released that release candidate um, a few days ago, and that has been where my majority focus has been. Um, and in that, I worked on a, a fair number of those things, um, including the stuff to get the engines set up uh, working, because I had my own need for engines come up. Um, I've been working on two engine sort of apps or integrations, or whatever you want to call it, um, two engines, one for a translation um, feature I was doing some uh, translation of Basecamp, and I wanted kind of an app to control those YAML files. Uh, and secondly, I've been working on um, a Rails engine that I had some potential for for making it into Rails uh, 3 at some point. For Rails 3, I think one of the things that I've, I've started to get a lot more interested in is um, revamping our approach to Ajax. And not so much because it's unobtrusive as a pursuit of standards compliance or something like that. I don't think that's all that interesting. Uh, or it isn't all that interesting to me, I should say. I know that there's plenty of people who care about it, and um, peace be with that. Um, for me, it was more a realization of saying, how could I make more stuff that I want to do in JavaScript easier to do? Um, I've just been actually just for the past past few days working on a, a tiny mini app um, where I did that simple trick where you replace uh, timestamps with relative zones to, through JavaScript and doing that through custom attributes. And I've been kind of interested in that whole custom attributes thing for a while, so that's one of the things that I'd like to be definitely involved in and pursuing. Uh, some of the two other things that I've been involved in has been more perhaps on the API design level. Um, we've been talking for some time about how can we merge the MERV router with the Rails router. And for me, I have not actually touched the underlying implementation of any router for a very, very, very long time. Uh, uh, implementing a router that has all the features that we want in both MERV and the Rails is really hard work. And as you guys know, I, I generally do not like hard work. So we've been having uh, a lot of other people working on that. But I do care about one thing, which is how the API for declaring your routes work. Um, so I've been taking a very keen interest in making the API as sweet as, um, as possibly can be. I think that the one we have in Rails right now is pretty good, but it's definitely not perfect. There's a lot of good ideas from both the web router and from what Sinatra is doing and from just our own approach and pursuit of, uh, of REST principles that can make the, um, the routing files a whole lot easier to deal with and easier to use and so on and so forth. Um, so that will probably be two of the major issues that I personally care about um, working on for Rails 3. Uh, better setup for, for JavaScript and auscetism and obtrusiveness and um, making the router API a great API. Um, but to me, the interesting thing about working on Rails is at least as much about just continuing to polish 
Um, every single time we fix something in Rails, we take out the way a problem, something else pops up and kind of um, stands out as this should be better. This should just be improved. And I think that's the, the great pleasure of being involved with something like Rails that continuously improves. You're never done. We're never going to be done with Rails. As soon as we get all the problems we think right now are big problems with Rails solved, there will be a whole other class of problems popping up just because they're now visible. Um, and that's just how it goes, and that's why it's so fun. I mean, I, I've been working on this stuff for six years, and I still find time to make um, things nicer almost every single day that I actually sit down and, and work on the Rails application. There's something about Rails that uh, is like, this could be better, this could be changed, this could be polished. Um, I hope that kind of answered your question. Um, I think, yeah, I think that was a, a, an answer to that question. I'm actually not Anthony. I would be your next question. Um, uh, what we decided it might be a little better for you to actually look at the person asking the question sure. instead of... Sure, that's even better. Um, so, so we're working on that. Um, so kind of as a follow-up, my, my question, uh, I guess there's a little bit of a build-up to it, but obviously you guys have just released uh, 2.3, or at least the release candidate for 2.3, um, and, and that carried middleware and a few extra things in it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously to this point we've been talking about the MERB push toward uh, adding in the features for MERB toward Rails 3. Um, so my question, I'm probably also later on, I think Yehuda's here, right? So, so I'll probably pose it to him as well. Um, working on both frameworks, um, by the way, my name's Nathan Bibler. I didn't, I didn't actually introduce myself to you. Um, working in both the frameworks, you know, they're, they're somewhat dissimilar in the way they're set up. Um, obviously, uh, MERB is, is very formatted, structured, whereas Rails has a lot of termed magic to it. Things happen for you, uh, which is kind of a, a different feeling. Um, so going forward, you know, migrating an application from 2.2 or 2.3 into 3, is it, what do you see as the migration path? I know it's still early. Um, is it going to be more Rails oriented so that people from the Rails side are going to feel less of a change? Um, you know, is it going to be a trade-off so that both sides are going to have to make adjustments? You know, what, what do you feel as, as kind of the, the uh, more heavily weighted side on that sure. equation, I guess? Well, it's definitely going to be a trade-off. There's definitely going to be things that you will need to change in a Rails 2.3 application to make it work with 3.0. There's no question about that. We're adopting um, a bunch of the ideas from, from the MERP side of things, and some of those ideas will be backwards and compatible, which is why this is not an effort for Rails 2.4. It's a rail, an effort for Rails 3.0. But with all that being said, we are basing this work on Rails um, components that are already there. We're evolving the Rails components to, to merge in the good ideas that uh, the Merp guys brought to, uh, to the table. So, I mean, it's probably going to feel a little bit more like Rails stuff, but I don't even really think that that matters that much in the end anyway. Um, from my first eye view perspective, Merp and Rails was a whole lot more similar than it was dissimilar. Um, so all of that stuff will continue to be. But um, I do think that there's some things that will remain a difference. So, for example, Rails definitely has more um, defaults set up already. I think that the Merp guys were already moving in that direction. There was now a, there was a stack gem that kind of pulled everything together and kind of sat up or put up some of these uh, uh, some defaults already. So I think we're kind of they were on the road to that in some aspects anyway. And um, in the aspects where they weren't, I mean, in the aspects of allowing you to, to insert your own framework and not having it be painful in any way and so forth. That's the kind of stuff we're going to take into Rails. So in some ways, I, I think it's going to be going to be work great out for, for both camps, for both migration paths, because the Rails guys are going to say, all right, I'm just or some Rails guys are making broad and sweeping generalizations here. Um, people coming from the Rails camp will instantly feel that setting up a new application Every single default is there. We're not going to yank defaults out. We're not going to, when you set up a new application, force you to make a lot of decisions about things. So if you just want that on the track, uh, conventions, I'm just going to take what Rails gives me, your ride is going to be the same, if not even smoother. If you don't want that, if you're coming in more with a, hey, I'd like to use do different frameworks here for things that Rails already have defaults for, uh, kind of like more of a MERB uh, construction kit approach, 
we're going to try our hardest to make that really easy to do. I don't think, I mean, that's kind of the part where I was answering earlier, where I don't think there's that much conflict. I don't think it's that hard to move, make both of these things work. The fact that there is defaults does not necessarily make it harder to have a choice. Um, to me, what's important to me is just that um, the choice is not forced upon you. The choice is optional. You make a choice when you have a specific opinion about something that you care deeply about. And then who am I to say that your choice is, is good or bad? I'm totally fine with that. What I care about is setting up a framework that's incredibly easy to use for people who don't know how to make those choices yet. Or who are happy to make the same choices as, as I'm making and as we've been making in the Rails uh, community for a long time. So I think there's very well room to, to fit both of those approaches on the same uh, roof. Thank you very much. Sure. Hi, David. I'm Matt Williams. Hey. Uh, so my question, this could be very short and sweet, is um, with the release of Ruby 191, um, how are you as uh, one of the large influences of Rails and um, 37 Signals as a company um, plan on embracing um, these new releases that are finally becoming a little more stable, um, have the speed increases? Um, yep. Any... Uh, um, so the, the roadmap uh, at 37 Signals for 1.9 is uh, called Jeremy Kemper. Uh, he's been the uh, guy at, uh, at 37 Signals and in the Rails team in general who's been uh, really good at keeping up with, uh, with 1.9. Um, he's been putting in a ton of work for a very long time to make sure that Rails itself was uh, 1.9 compatible. Um, so in many ways I'm delegating to his uh, uh, advice on this uh, because I have not even installed 1.9.1 or any 1.9 release. Uh, really on my own computer and, and fooled around with it. Um, so it, it's pretty much when uh, I'm going to install it is when Jeremy Kempis says it's ready, we're good to go. We, I now have uh, Basecamp running on it and, uh, and you should run it too. Uh, so to me, I mean, I think it's great that there's still a lot of development going on with, uh, um, with Ruby and I think it's awesome that they're expanding it and one nine time. Wonderful in many ways, but it just, it, it's not going to have that huge of an impact on what it is that I do every day. So I just tend to say, all right, I mean, there's people who are passionate about that and following that. I don't need to follow that in that much detail. Um, so so I don't. So it's, uh, that, that's basically the answer for, for both Rails and for uh, uh, Thursday and Sequels. It's, it's Jeremy Kimber. When he says it's, it's go, it's, uh, it's time to me to give it a try. But I do hope that... Uh, He's not the only guy in the world giving it a try. It'd be uh, kind of a lonely pursuit. So uh, it'd be awesome if um, everybody kind of would give it a chance. Uh, okay. At least having one person within each company or group saying, hey, I'm going to give one uh, a chance for our application, see where it breaks. Try to get these uh, issues uh, published and out there before it's slapped with a stable um, production release. On it, I think we've had some problems in the past with Ruby, especially with Ruby 187, where it just it dropped one day, and it was kind of bad in many backwards compatible ways. It wasn't a great smooth release. And I think some of that just came from the fact that how many people were actually keeping up today with the 18 branch? How many people were trying out the, the latest version, compiling it, and testing it with their apps? Probably not enough. And it's kind of a similar problem that we often have with Rails. Um, people in general just aren't very interested in trying beta releases. Um, and we've had this problem in the past, even re release candidates with Rails. We just wouldn't have enough testers. And as soon as we declare Rails, whatever version, to be final, all these bug reports would come up. Because people wouldn't try it until it was final. And I mean, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. I mean, it can't be final until we have people who actually test it. Um, and, I mean, it's just, it's not a fault. But, I mean, I understand, as I just said, I, I have not been keeping up today with 1.9. I'm, my excuse is Kemper. Um, so, I, I just hope that more people would definitely try out 
both newer version of Rails and newer versions of Ruby on a more regular basis, such that we don't have those um, big bang solutions for a new version of Ruby drops, a new version of Rails drops, and all of a sudden people find the problems that just as well can found well in advance. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, David. I'm Brian Lyles. Hey, Brian. Um, I want to ask you about with the emergence of the lightweight HTTP libraries like HTTP Party and REST Client, um, mm -hmm. what's going to happen with Active Resource? Is there, I'm looking for compelling reasons to use Active Resource in my applications now. Are sure. There? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the, um, the, we actually talked about this recently. Um, we had a, a small sprint in Chicago. Uh, where Yehuda, Rick, and uh, Josh, and myself was present. And we talked about, so what is the role of, of active resources supposed to be? And I think we came a little bit closer to the answer by saying active resource is a very narrowly constrained uh, solution. Active resource is in many ways as what active record is to, um, to a database driver. So a database driver is very generic. You can do a lot of things. You can do any type of, of SQL. Um, active record has a much narrower focus. It relies on a greater set of conventions, and it then gives you an easy write of that. Active resources, in many ways, the same way. When you have, when you use the active uh, resource against a Rails application that was built on top of all of those conventions, it's going to be really nice and easy to use. Active resource today is not a great tool for generic web applications, generic REST applications, things that wasn't built with active resource in mind, things that wasn't built on top of those uh, conventions. So if you're trying to integrate with some API that's RESTful, but not in any way built on top of the um, Rails conventions, you're probably going to have a much better time using REST client and HTTP party. On the other hand, if you are using uh, REST against a Rails backend, active resource is going to be a great ride. That's all I've ever used active resource for. We use active resource internally at 30 to integrate our applications because all our applications are Rails. So all those conventions are already set up for us. So I think the simple answer is if you're um, going to do REST against a Rails application, use active resource. I doubt that HTTP party and REST client is going to be significantly easier to use than, uh, than active resources in that case. But if you're using it against something else, something that wasn't written with Rails or active resources, open those conventions in mind, don't feel any shame at all. REST client and HTTP party and the more low-level uh, solutions to that are great. There's plenty of room for, uh, for both ends of the spectrum, which is in some ways kind of a similar realization that we're making with Rails. So the, act, or the default ORM in Rails is going to be active resource and, or active record. And active record is great when you have more power over your schema. Uh, but sometimes you don't. You have zero power over your schema. And a lot of people have been trying to bend active record to fit all sorts of sort of weird, or I shouldn't even say weird, different schemas or uh, ancient schemas or whatever you want to call it. Um, and it doesn't always work that great. And I think sometimes we just come to the realization active record is not going to be uh, a great solution for all of that. There's SQL, there's data mapper, there's other types of tools that works better when you don't have the luxury of having the conventions available. All of the frameworks in Rails are built to work together in the sense that you get that luxury, you get that benefit of having all those conventions. That's why we can write so little code when we can rely on all these conventions working. And that's great when that's the case. When it's not the case, when you don't have the convention you can build on top of, don't feel any shame using anything else. I would. One last question. Uh, David, sure. do you test all the fucking time? <laughs> if I test? No, do you test all the fucking time? I'm not even sure how to parse that question. You mean if I unit test everything I do? Say that again? Do I unit test? No, what do you, do? What do you mean? just test? I don't care. Unit, exception, I mean, in integration, acceptance, functional. Uh, no. Okay. I know. Um, I just wrote an entire application that didn't have a single test. Um, the application was 78 lines, so there wasn't a whole lot of stuff to test, 
But um, I did. And, and to me, I, I think it's actually interesting because there's been this thread lately of uh, Bob Martin and uh, Joe Spolsky and all that stuff on, on whether testing or quality is, is useful. Um, and I absolutely think testing is useful. If we did not have tests for, for base camp, oh my God. I mean, how can you even imagine constantly improving the application that's been living for six years if you did not know whether you would break something when you introduced a new feature? It would just be impossible. Um, but at the same time, I just wrote this tiny application to, uh, to inform people if there's something that's down, just a small status application, as I said, 78 lines of code. Does it make sense to test that? No, not really. How likely is it that this application is going to change? Very unlikely. And if it is going to change, I have to fathom 78 lines of code. I think I can do that. So in that case, testing wasn't worth it for me. But um, testing is absolutely worth it when I work on the 10,000 lines of code that we have for Facecam that has been around for six years. Um, so it's all a matter of just the criticality uh, and uh, kind of the, the environment that you're in given application. And some applications are going to live for a very long time and they're going to change frequently. You'd be uh, reckless not to have tests for those kind of applications. Other applications are going to live for a very short time. We're not going to be changed at all. And maybe it's not worth it that case. All right. Thanks, David. Sure. Hello, David. Uh, my hey. name is Adam Dalton, and I got a question. Uh, I've often heard you say that you know web design isn't rocket surgery, and what I want to know is, could it be? Could could Ruby on Rails be used for really mission critical apps like, say, next gen um, flight control or launch control services for NASA? And and if so, what arguments would you make to the developers that hey, take a look at Ruby and Rails? So. I should first preface this by saying I've never built anything with that type of criticality. I've never built anything where people die if I have a bug. So anything I say is, 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 um, is kind of just my outside observation. But from what I've heard, um, the way that this stuff works, I talked to a guy who's been working on software for pacemakers. Um, and it's not really about the, the code itself. It's about your review processes. So, for example, for this uh, page maker project, for every single line of code that they wrote that was going to go into the software, they had an incredibly rigorous review process where they tested tons of things with different people and so on and so forth. Um, so, in, in that scenario, I mean, you're going to hopefully get the bugs out of that system just by reviewing everything that goes into it. And that kind of is similar to how you get rid of bugs in, in regular systems, too. Um, it's about, do we have a good idea of what all this code is doing? If, if the code we have to review is, is 2,000 lines of code, um, is that harder or easier to review and make sure that it's proper and correct than it is to review 20,000 lines of code? So I think that's often how the argument comes down. Um, that being said, I mean, you would probably also have to do a full review of all the rail stuff that you would use and so forth to make sure it's right. But I don't, it, in some ways, I think this notion of criticality has a little bit of um, paper dragon to it because it, it kind of, it, it is, no, there's something magic in the system, that there's something you cannot see even though you turn it around and look at it from all angles. Um, to get super high quality, to me, is by far more about process than it is about anything else. It's about making sure you have incredible test coverage. It's about making sure you have multiple people reviewing the same kind of code. There's nothing magical that makes um, a language or a platform usable for um, for pacemakers. I mean, people have certainly written bugs in C or C++ code, which is what these guys were using for the pacemaker uh, uh, project. I mean, they've had buffer overflows. They've had all sorts of bugs creep into it. And how did they get rid of all this stuff? Just by rigorous review and process. I think that's absolutely possible in any, um, in any platform or with any field. I mean, all that being said, big disclaimer not to be responsible if your Rails app uh, 
blows up the next Apollo mission or something. That uh, goes without saying. Thank you. Hi, David. Um, hey. I'm going to act as a proxy for a few questions that a few other people wanted to ask. So these are just really quick questions. Um, Maria sure. necessary wanted to know that if you could only have one of the following two for the rest of your life, which would you choose, cake or pie? What? <laughs> cake or pie? So if for the rest of your life you could only have one of the following two items, would you choose cake or pie? Mm. <laughs> Banana cream pie. Oh, uh, the rest of my life. Good, good. Um, Jay uh, Tenier wanted to know um, when you were going to change your hairstyle. <laughs> what, what is he talking about? This is the most timeless hairstyle there is. It's going to, for the next hundred years, be. It's top of the top. That, that, you don't change that. That's not how it goes. So, so that's a never? <laughs> yes. Okay, all right. Um, Infinity. Never. Um, Les Allen wanted to know um, why you aren't following at Les Allen on Twitter. <laughs> I don't know who at Les Allen is. So, um, <laughs> Jason knows. Um, okay. and, and although this, is, this question is now moot with uh, the announcement of um, Rails 3.0, myself and a bunch of other people actually really wanted to know who you thought would win in a fight, you or Yehuda. <laughs> I, I, I've been taking fencing classes, so you better come armed. If it, uh, if it. <laughs> Thanks very much. That was interesting. <laughs> um, does anybody else have any questions? Oh, yep, great. All right. Hey, David, this is Greg. Hey, Greg. Hey, did you see uh, at uh, RubyConf, which was here in Orlando, um, Dave Thomas did a keynote. Did you Did you see his keynote? He basically... I haven't seen it, no. It okay, was the fourth right. keynote. I've heard the gist of it, I think. Yeah, the Cotton Freaks guy got it. But uh, basically, he talked about how he wants to see different flavors of Ruby, like a parallel Ruby or a closure Ruby, different flavors of Ruby, mm -hmm. with Rails 3.0 becoming more modular. I'm wondering, I, I can see how it would become more easy to, for people to create maybe different flavors of Rails, right? Mm -hmm. Like take an individual library, minimize it, or design it for maybe a different type of web application. And sure. I'm just curious to, if you have any thoughts on that, maybe some you know, different flavors of Rails that you might want to see. I think that's great. I think another feature we actually have already in 2.3 that sort of makes this possible is templates. Um, so people have already have kind of like their house blend Rails, which would be more often just a compilation of all the things that they commonly use. I think templates is really a, a great way of, of uh, making the first step towards having your own house blend. Uh, at 37 Sickles, we definitely have our own house blend. We have a number of uh, plugins we always use and a kind of a process that we always use for deployment and so on. So that's the first step of doing that. I think it's great, and I think people should probably share it. Um, I mean, there might very well be that our house blend is something that somebody else would like to. Um, for the more fundamental stuff, I absolutely think this is true as well. Um, we should be making it really easy uh, for people to substitute many different things of real. One of the concrete aspects that we've recently talked a fair bit about is the, uh, the router. So currently we have a good number of router ideas up in the air. There will definitely be one main router, one default router, and this goes for all of this stuff. That I, this is kind of like next level stuff. The house blend, your own alternative, experimenting. It's all for people who kind of reach the, the natural borders of where Rails doesn't fit for them anymore. Most people will be very happy if you're using people. Anyway, so for the, the router, um, we want to make it pluggable. We want to make it such that, um, I forget who it was, who was working on a new router. Um, Pratic was in over, but somebody else uh, was working on um, making a tiny router that didn't have the same number of features, um, but it was only two more lines of code. Um, and those kind of experiments are correct. We absolutely want to encourage 
those kinds of experiments, and if we in Rails can make it easy for people to try it out, that'd be awesome. Um, the same goes for, for all the work that's going into agnosticism in, in general, to make it really easy for Rails to, to use another JavaScript library. It shouldn't just be that, all right, right now, prototype and jQuery or kind of the, the big libraries, um, and then we just hard code into that and nothing else will work. Agnosticism is not just about taking the number of choices from one to two or one to three. It's about allowing anybody to come up with a new, next great idea and, uh, and plug it right in. So I, I think it's awesome. I think um, I'd love to see more experimentation. And this is a lot of times what we say about uh, let's try it out in the plugin. Like that's often the kind of the answer to something that seems a little off for foreign pollution, but might be a really interesting idea. Um, templates is a, is a great example. Templates started out as, as somewhat of a plugin. A lot of the good ideas that have gone into Rails uh, over the past year, over many years, have started out as plugins. So I want to just like encourage everybody to try out crazy idea. And that's also kind of why we've had internally somewhat of a debate on monkey patching. And monkey patching has this, is a very double-edged sword. On the one hand, monkey patching allows you to basically change anything you want in Ruby, in Rails, anywhere. But if you monkey patch, kind of the agreement then is that if you're experimenting with uh, stuff that is stable, it could blow up at any minute. Uh, and if people could just accept that trade-off, that, all right, I want to just experiment with something that's radically different for Rails, which requires me to override these things and alias method chain that thing and so on. Um, and just realize, all right, I'm doing an experiment. If that experiment works out, if this is something, hey, this is generally desirable, other people would want it, I would want to distribute it, then you go back and say, all right, how do I make sure that this doesn't blow up every five minutes that the Rails guys change something in the internals of Rails? So I definitely want to get that out, too, that if you're going to go on on your um, exploration with uh, with serious experimentation and, and alias method of changes, that and the other thing, and override and so on, it's going to be fragile, very, very fragile. And um, that's just the trade-off. I love that trade-off, though, i got to say. There's been times where I've found something in Ruby or the Ruby standard library or something else that required deep monkey patching, but the trade-off was worth it. You just got to go in with your eyes open that, yes, this would break at any point, but there's been times, for example, we've had problems with the uh, the cookie library in um, in the Ruby standard uh, distribution had a bug at one point, and we just weren't willing to wait around until the next stable version of Ruby was released. So we monkey passed it right into the Rails, and, and it worked. And we pulled it out when it uh, when it wasn't necessary anymore. So two thumbs up to experimentation, even if it requires monkey patching. And uh, I think uh, be careful. If, uh, if you do monkey patch and, and it turns out to be something you want to keep across versions. Hey David, it's uh, Nate again. I think we're in the last uh, few minutes here, so I'm actually sure. going to kind of change the focus, I think, of this away from the framework and more, I think, toward the application development. I mean, at this point, you've kind of, uh, you know, at the very least, have a handful of what I think all of us would term as successful applications. Um, you know, being Basecamp or Campfire or High Rise or the list goes mm -hmm. on. Um, you know, I, I think this is an open-ended question, but, but what do you see as the major points for developing a successful application, be it the business side or, or the technical side or whatever you feel jumps out to you? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, one is, I think one of the major points I'm going to talk about a little bit at uh, in Dublin in, in about a month's time or so in uh, the future of web apps is, is sticking to it. Far too many people have um, ADD when it comes to their projects and it comes to their work. And they think that just because they didn't have a slam dunk success in three months, that that means that they are sitting on a failure. Lots of things look like a failure for a very long period of time until it turns into a success. Um, base camp by many, many definitions, was a huge failure for the first year. We couldn't even pay our bills for the first year, and we were a tiny team. So Basecamp failed by many other companies' standard definition of failure. But of course, we stuck to it, and now five, six years into it, it's doing millions of dollars of revenue every year. Um, 
So I think that's definitely a, a pretty important part of it. Um, second important part of it, I think, is all the applications that I've worked on, the framework I've worked on, everything that I work on, um, I have to be interested in it for my own purposes. Um, so I think it's just it's so much easier to make a application within the field where you care. Um, it's really hard if you have to fake caring because you're working in some industry or, or in some domain that you're just not really passionate about. Uh, it's very hard to pull together that excellence that's needed to break through. Um, so working on something that you personally care about, I find is just so much easier to the point where doing anything else seems almost impossibly hard. Um, what else would I say? Oh yeah, side projects. Um, I know lots of people, oh, I have this great idea, but I'm, I'm working a day job, there's no time, and blah, 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 blah. There's always time. There's always time to invest in this. Basecamp was built, I keep going back to this, and why I do it is, is because I think it, it's so true. We built a Basecamp with 10 hours per week. Most people waste 10 hours in a few days watching TV. Uh, I think something like the U.S. standard average is three or four hours of TV every day. They could have built base camp just sacrificing two nights of TV. Um, so stop whining about how little time you have, about not being able to put this through. You always have time. And what you just need to do is cut down on your scope. Make something that is buildable with 10, 15 hours on the side, even though you have a real job and you have to pay the bill and so on and so forth. Just sacrifice some of the things that are easy to sacrifice, like watching Lost, which is terrible now since the second season. <laughs> Holy suck. Um, yeah. All right. That, that, I think that's uh, kind of like the highlights of uh, what I can write off the top of my head. Thank you very much. Sure. Hi, David. It's uh, Robert again. I'm going to steal the last question, kind of piggybacking off of uh, what Nate was talking about. One of the themes that, I'm, that uh, Jason and I are trying to interweave in this year's Access Conference is really how Rails can help us as developers maintain a competitive edge. And we, mm -hmm. we know, of course, that we can develop apps um, you know, a lot faster than a lot of other uh, languages and frameworks that are out there and whatnot. And I was just uh, interested to here are a couple points from you of how you think that even going forward, how Rails can help us maintain our competitive edge. Sure. So I think one of the most important things about the Rails community is that we have a very strong sense of caring about our tools. There's lots of other communities where the majority of the developers in there do not truly care about their tools. Um, I think it, it's, it's very easy to say that um, pick the right tool for the job, and so on. And to me, those sort of things have a little bit lost their meaning. Um, I find it a lot more motivating and, and inspiring when I pick a few tools that I really, really like, and then I get good at them, and I continue to um, improve upon them. So one of the other things that's been out, which in general I think learning is always great, there's been this uh, notion of... Uh, learn a new language every year. I've failed that test for the past five years. Um, I've not learned a new language every year because I've been really passionate and dedicated about one language that I did learn five or six years ago called Ruby, uh, and I wanted to be better and improve on that. I think that goes kind of back to the, the whole notion of the ADD when it comes to project. I think lots of developers sort of also have ADD when it comes to tools. Um, but we definitely still have tons of people in the Rails community who's been with Rails for a very long time, who's been keeping up their contributions to the framework and always trying to, to improve on that polish. And I think that's a really important part of who we are. We care about the specific tool that it is that we're working with. And everybody, I think, if you take it as a percentage, I'm pretty sure that the Rails developers in general, that there's a much higher percentage of Rails developers who contribute to the common good. There's so many plugins out there. There are so many uh, bug reports and tutorials and documents and so on. We have a much higher uh, proportion of contributor or just uh, producer to consumer. We have a lot of people who are both. Uh, and I think that that's, keeping that spirit alive wherever you go is, 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 is a great way to stay ahead.
become not just a user of something, become not just a consumer of something, actively get engaged. How can I make this work better? Um, because I think that's how I learn the most. When I try to improve something, that's when I move forward. Just by using it, I mean, yeah, I can certainly learn something from that. I mean, I can certainly learn something and a new perspective just from learning another programming language, but it's only by really trying to improve that language or trying to improve that environment that I find that I really get the, the deep learning that moves me forward. Great. Well, hey, thank you very much again for all your time. Uh, on behalf sure. of you know everybody, I think you know honest, uh, very thorough answers is highly appreciated. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Have a great conference.